let's take a look at Newton's universal law of gravitation and the gravitational field. So previously we've seen that gravitational force is the same as weight, uh, and we have this nice equation, Fg is equal to mg, where g is equal to 9.8 meters per second squared downward, but we were careful to say that that's only on or near the surface of the Earth, where that's true. Uh, we can get a little more mileage out of it by noticing that if we go to the moon and stay at the surface of the moon, it's the same equation, it's just we alter g to equal 1.6 meters per second squared. And if we went to Mars, it's the same thing, but g is equal to 3.7 meters per second squared down. If we went to the International Space Station, same thing, but g is equal to 8.7 meters per second squared down. So then the question kind of comes up, well, is there a universal equation that would work everywhere? Instead of using this one equation that we have to adjust the value of g, is there just one equation that's always true? And there is. Uh, Newton figured it out. And it was a really, really big deal when Newton figured it out, because prior to this, it was assumed that Earth and the heavens um, had different laws. Uh, Newton showed that at least some of the rules are the same throughout the entire universe. That's kind of a big deal. But Newton's universal law of gravitation is written this way. F is equal to GMM over R squared. And we can vary the way that it's written, but it always means the same thing. Uh, so in this equation, F here on the left is the gravitational force on some mass, M. Uh, we'll skip G for a second. Uh, this M, capital M, is the mass that feels the gravitational force. And this mass is the mass causing the force. And r, here in the denominator, is the distance between the centers of the two masses. So going back to capital G. Capital G, my first physics teacher, he called it Big Daddy G. Uh, it's the gravitational constant of the universe. It's equal to 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newton meters squared per kilogram squared. That's a weird unit, but that is a constant that makes this equation work. Um, now, one strange thing about this Newton's law of universal gravitation is there's no contact required for a gravitational force to occur. And we haven't really thought about that a lot, but that is kind of weird, right? Um, two things that don't touch can still have a force between them. So how does the force get communicated? That's odd. Um, the force is always attractive. Keep that in mind. Um, this equation only tells you the magnitude of the force. It doesn't give the direction. The direction comes from the idea that the force is always attractive. And it also assumes that the objects we're talking about, these two masses that we're talking about, are point masses. Now, of course, objects aren't really points, all right? Like everything has some kind of length, width, and height. But it's usually a good assumption. This assumption that things are points is a very, very good assumption as long as the distance between the objects is much greater than their individual sizes. And a funny thing, we're not going to prove this, but this also holds if the object is a uniform sphere. So for example, the Earth is not exactly a uniform sphere, but it's approximately a uniform sphere. So it works pretty darn well um, when we do that. And when we do that, if we have a uniform sphere, then the r in this equation is the distance between the center of the two objects. So let's do a quick example. Let's say that we have Mars and Phobos. So Phobos is a moon of Mars. And we know the mass of Mars and the mass of Phobos. And we know the distance between them. If we're trying to find the gravitational force on Phobos by Mars, then we use Newton's universal law of gravitation. F is equal to GMM over R squared. And so we have what? 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newton meters squared per kilogram squared times the mass of Phobos, 1.07 times 10 to the 16 kilograms times the mass of Mars, 6.42 times 10 to the 23 kilograms divided by the distance between their centers, which is 9.38 times 10 to the 6 meters. And we square that in the denominator. And when we do all that, put in your calculator correct that the gravitational force on Phobos by Mars is 5.21 times 10 to the 15 newtons. And that force is attractive. So the force on Phobos is toward Mars. Now notice, if we were to switch the two masses, what would happen? We'd get the exact same number.
because they're being multiplied together. And that's going to relate to Newton's universal law of gravitation and Newton's third law. So if we have these two masses, m and m, distance r between them, the force of the larger mass on the smaller mass is equal and opposite to the force of the smaller mass on the larger mass. So that's exactly what Newton's third law would lead us to expect. The force of one on the other is equal and opposite to the force of the other on the one. That agrees with Newton's third law. Newton's third law is kind of baked into Newton's universal law of gravitation already. Okay, now let's consider a situation where we have three masses. What do we do if we have three masses? The equation only has two masses in it. Well, there's more than two masses in the universe. What do we do? Well, let's say we have the sun, the moon, and the earth, like this. And we want to find the total gravitational force on the moon that's between the sun and the earth in this picture. Well, what we'd have to do is first we'd have to find the gravitational force on the moon by the sun. Figure that out. Then we'd have to find the gravitational force on the moon by the earth. Figure that out. It's in the opposite direction. And the total gravitational force on the moon would be the sum of those two forces. And if you look at the picture that I've drawn, we'd have one force that's toward the sun, one force in the opposite direction toward the earth. The sum would be the total force on the moon. And when I say sum here, I really mean vector sum, because you have to take into account the direction. All right, now let's take a look at gravitational field. So the gravitational field strength, the very general definition of it, is the gravitational field strength is equal to the gravitational force on a mass at a location divided by that mass. So it's the gravitational force per mass at a location. So let's say that there's an astronaut floating out in space far away from other masses, and the astronaut has a mass of 100 kilograms when you add up all the spacesuit and everything, and the gravitational force on that astronaut is 90 newtons. So we can figure out the gravitational field strength at that astronaut's location because it's equal to the gravitational force divided by the mass. It's 90 newtons divided by 100 kilograms. So the gravitational field strength at that astronaut's location is 0 0.900 meters per second squared to the left. Now this uh, gravitational field strength becomes easier to calculate if you have just one object creating the gravitational field. If, the object, if there's just one object that's responsible for creating the field, then we can write this gravitational force as gmm over r squared divided by m. And the m that's going to cancel out is the mass that experiences the force. So the mass that experiences the force cancels out, and we're left with the gm over r squared, where that m that remains in the equation is the mass that's causing the force, and it's also causing the field. And that r in the equation, remember, is the distance from the center of the object that's creating the field. So we also have this equation that we often use. g is equal to gm over r squared. The g on the right is the big daddy g, the gravitational constant of the universe, and that little g on the left is gravitational field strength. Now, wait a minute. Little g already has a meaning. It's the acceleration due to gravity. Well, hey, it's the same thing. Gravitational field strength is the same as the acceleration due to gravity. That's weird, but that's the way it works out. Uh, and so g on the surface of the Earth, we know, should be 9.8 meters per second squared. Let's see if we can use this equation to make that happen. Well, the mass of the Earth is 5.97 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. The radius of the Earth is 6.37 times 10 to the 6 meters. So let's plug those numbers into this equation for gravitational field strength. If you do, surprise, surprise, you get out 9.8 meters per second squared. So gravitational field strength is the same thing as acceleration due to gravity. Uh, one other thing, the units of g. If you look at our equation, g is defined as, or gravitational field strength is defined as the gravitational force per mass. If you look at that, the units suggested by the equation are newtons divided by kilograms, newtons per kilogram. That's a common unit for gravitational field strength. You can either use meters per second squared or newtons per kilogram. And the last thing we're going to look at is gravitational field lines. 
So gravitational field lines are just a way to represent the gravitational field in an, a volume of space. So I'm just going to draw a mass right here, and I'm going to draw the gravitational field lines around it. And the meaning of the gravitational field lines is they point in the direction of the gravitational field, or the gravitational, yeah, the gravitational field and the gravitational force on an object at any location. Um, one way that they're useful is the density of the lines is proportional to the field strength. So when the lines are closer together, that's telling you that the field strength at that location is stronger. So in this picture, gravitational field strength is shown to be stronger near the planet because that's where the field lines are closer together. And that makes sense. Get closer to the planet, gravitational field strength increases. And also the field lines end at masses. Um, and the more lines that end at a mass implies a greater mass of the object. So I'm going to try to draw a picture of a large mass and a small mass. Maybe this is like the Earth and the Moon and the gravitational field lines that might show up around it. I can't do it perfectly because I'm doing this by hand. But if you see, the larger mass has more gravitational field lines going towards it and ending at it. And the smaller mass out here has fewer lines ending at it.